I am pleased to introduce our next speaker. James Tendwa is the outgoing executive director of Chicago Jobs with Justice. Jobs with Justice is a coalition of labor, community, faith, and student organizations that advocates for workers' rights and livable communities. Prior to joining JWJ, Tendwa served for nine years as lead organizer for Metro Seniors in Action, a coalition that advocates for national health care, mass transit, rights for managed care patients, and maintaining Social Security and Medicare as public programs. Between 1985 and 1992, Mr. Tendwa served as staff director for the Citizens Action Coalition of Indiana and Ohio Citizen Action. He serves on the boards of the Illinois Labor History Society, Northwestern University's Children and Family Justice Center, and In These Times Magazine, for which he occasionally writes. Tindua was a leader in the anti-apartheid movement in the 1970s and 1980s and remains active in anti-war, human rights, environmental, and global justice struggles. His work as an organizer was the subject of PBS's Bill Moyers Journal on March 27th. He has a BA and an MA in political science from Berea College and Miami University in Ohio, respectively. Please join me in welcoming James Tindua. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and uh, good afternoon to you all. How's the conference going? Yeah, everybody learning a lot and uh, exchanging uh, good ideas. I cut the tail end of the last lecture. There was, uh, I was wishing I'd, uh, I'd been around at the beginning. Um, Chicago uh, Jobs with Justice is a coalition of uh, labor and community, religious, um, and student organizations, some policy groups that are part of that uh, organization, whose mission is to, uh, to lend support to workers who uh, want to form unions. Uh, we strongly believe that uh, a healthy democracy is simply not possible without uh, a robust uh, labor movement. Uh, and this, this is borne out by, by history. The facts on the ground are quite compelling. Uh, the best uh, functioning democracies in the world today, uh, in the West, uh, North America, uh, Japan, also have uh, labor movements that have played a significant role, that continue to play a significant role, although uh, in the United States, uh, labor has been in decline for quite some time. That They played a, 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 a big role in developing uh, strong middle classes and um, uh, educating workers, and uh, really being, uh, being champions of, uh, of social justice. Um, labor unions are a, uh, a force that uh, uh, has, has so many implications for society. We know that when workers uh, belong to unions, they're much more uh, civically engaged. Uh, data show that uh, workers who belong to unions vote in larger numbers, uh, they contribute more to uh, uh, local institutions in their communities. They're just much more uh, active. And so uh, from a personal note, I grew up in southern Africa in, in the country of Zimbabwe, and uh, so I, have a, I came here with a little bit, a, a slightly different, uh, a, a slightly more mature view of labor than my counterparts when I was a freshman at uh, Berea College, where I, I heard a, a just a, an, an enormous amount of negative talk, talk about union, most of it, uh, anecdote driven um, uh, that focused on uh, corruption of individuals, whether it was Jimmy Hoffa or uh, Jackie Presser, the Teamsters, and uh, there was sort of this focus on the flaws within the labor movement as if institutions uh, in, in society are expected to be perfect. And, and uh, certainly when you compare with uh, what's happening on the corporate side, and especially of late, uh, there's a lot of uh, corruption and, um, and malfeasance to go around. So I've I'd never really understood why there was a single-minded focus on corruption when, when one talked about um, um, uh, labor unions. Uh, I, in, in Southern Africa, unions were very much involved in the anti-colonial struggles in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, in Malawi, in Botswana, and, and uh, I heard labor leaders speak uh, uh, about issues beyond the, the, the bargaining table. Labor leaders spoke about oppression, that uh, they were involved in anti-racist struggles, they were involved in women's rights movement. And so I grew up sort of having a vision of labor as a broad um, institution, a, a force, a movement that, was, uh, that carried a broad range of agendas from uh, you know, civil rights to 
uh, labor rights to uh, uh, anti-racism and so forth. And, and so uh, I, I decided quite early, earlier on that if I, if I didn't end up teaching at a university, which I didn't do, I dropped out of, I dropped out of uh, grad school. After, after I left Miami University, I went to Ohio State University to try to uh, work in a doctoral uh, program and uh, decided I really wanted to be an activist on a full-time basis. And one thing that I really was interested in doing is finding some way to work directly uh, with unions or work that allowed me to intersect uh, with, uh, with, with labor unions. So in many ways, Jobs with Justice was a perfect place for me because what it does, it, uh, it brings community organizations together uh, to work with unions to empower workers and to make sure that uh, they have a voice uh, uh, at work. There's no question, uh, I, there's very little debate now that uh, we have witnessed runaway corporate power, that there's a disproportionate power concentrated uh, in the hands of CEOs, and uh, it's quite evident what that has led us to. There's no, um, I, I think, any analysis of uh, the current collapse in the, uh, in the, in the economy, of the, of the economy uh, cannot uh, exclude the degree to which uh, the collective voice of workers has been uh, ignored, uh, not included uh, in uh, corporate uh, institutions. Uh, and of course, the declining numbers of uh, union um, uh, Union members in the United States is, is quite troubling. Uh, in, 19, in the early 1970s, 1973, 33% uh, of the labor force was unionized. Uh, that number is now down to about 8.5%. Uh, um, um, no, 33% 30, yeah, in, in 1973, uh, 85 currently, it's about 10% if you include uh, public sector workers. So this has a lot of implications for for democracy and for public policy. Because if you go back and you look at when, when labor was strong, uh, what was accomplished? What did labor contribute uh, to this society? Uh, you know, a lot of things that we take for granted, the, uh, the five-day week, uh, overtime pay, um, uh, weekends and vacations, and um, healthcare benefits, uh, you name it. Uh, you know, good salaries when workers belong to unions. And um, uh, in terms of public policy, uh, you know, you, you know, labor has, you, you look at the family, the family Leave Act back in 1992, uh, the minimum wage was going up quite steadily for a while, and then uh, in 1997, it hit a roadblock, uh, and for, ten, for the next 10 years, from 1997 uh, to 2007, the minimum wage stayed at about $5.15, and that can also be traced to uh, the declining uh, power of labor unions, the inability of unions to exert their presence in the public uh, policy arena and, um, and, and force a, uh, a, continu a continued increase in the, uh, uh, in the minimum wage. And so um, and we're also seeing a, a, an enormous amount of social stability in communities that uh, were relatively stable. And I'm not, I'm not someone who wears rose glasses and looking back to history, uh, uh, many of these communities in the south side of Chicago and, and, and west side of Chicago, for example, uh, have had you know, problems for a while, but there's no question that uh, uh, those problems have been exacerbated by disappearing work uh, or de declining wages that, have, uh, that are in part attributable to um, declining unionization rates. Uh, so what we've tried to do in, 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 in Jobs with Justice is to say that the decline in the numbers of workers who are unionized need not result in less power uh, for unions, that what we need to do is to convince community organizations, convince religious groups, uh, convince other forces within the uh, community that they have a stake in what happens to workers. Uh, some of this is kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a given, something that we should uh, uh, automatically assume, but uh, it, it bears repeating that uh, when, work, when, when workers stop bringing money uh, to these communities, uh, those local institutions uh, suffer, they, they, they die. Uh, there's no way uh, you look at some of the churches on the west side, the south side of Chicago, um, and, and other institutions that uh, historically have provided good services. Um, I've spoken to ministers who had you know, big churches who used to provide uh, uh, you know, sh shelters for homeless people, uh, after-school programs for kids, um, shelters for battered women, soup kitchens on weekends, and uh, they can't do that anymore because their members who... Many of them uh, who used to work in the industrial sector, workers who worked at, uh, uh, in Gary, the steel mills, and, and uh, making $25, $30 an hour, um, are now working at Home Depot uh, for $7 um, or $8 uh, an hour. And so that translates into 
uh, fewer uh, dollars being collected on Sunday and uh, less services being provided uh, to the community. So part of what I've been doing over the years uh, at Jobs as Justice is really approaching community organizations and saying, the reason you should come to the Congress Hotel to join that picket line down there uh, isn't just a question of social justice for those workers. Uh, your communities are affected uh, enormously when, when uh, workers are marginalized at work and when they can't bring in uh, resources into those neighborhoods. Local grocery stores, local hardware stores, when workers can't get in there on weekends and buy stuff, fix their homes and, and so forth, uh, those stores uh, will not do very well. So, you know, at, on, a, on a macro level, it's, it's also uh, it's impossible to, uh, to analyze the current economic crisis outside of this general context in which uh, workers are making, making less and less money. Uh, you know, American workers are increasingly unable uh, to buy products uh, that uh, they make. You can't run an economy like that. That's simply not, not, not sustainable. You know, we've heard the analysis around sort of the banking crisis and, and what the bankers have done to the economy. We've heard about the whole mortgage uh, uh, lending crisis, but we have not heard enough about um, the role of a low-wage uh, economy uh, in, the, in the collapse of, this, um, um, of, the, of, of our uh, economic system uh, currently. So um, I say this to really elevate unionization as a very, very important uh, concept and a very important phenomenon in, in uh, building uh, democracies and, 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 and uh, um, building um, good, uh, robust economies and, uh, and, and building good, strong uh, neighborhoods. Um, so why, why have unions uh, declined? Uh, there are many explanations, obviously, uh, and, and, and um, part of it, obviously, is that globalization has put an enormous amount of pressures on, uh, on corporations who are uh, now competing with... Uh, uh, with uh, global, other global corporations who uh, uh, you know, work in societies that uh, uh, have, don't have very strong laws. You know, they don't have strong labor laws, for example. Uh, you know, the, in some countries, you simply don't have a right to organize. Uh, they're weak human, human rights standards. They um, have weak environmental laws. And so... Um, uh, it, th th those countries both serve as a destination for those corporations who want to go out and exploit cheap labor uh, and not be burdened by uh, regulations, uh, and also that products that are made in those countries inherently become cheaper and undermine uh, corporations here. So it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a, there's a strong uh, relationship there. Um, but there's no question that the decline of unions is also a function of uh, intentional strategies. Um, elaborate strategies by corporations uh, to undermine uh, labor unions. How has this taken place? It's, it's taken place in many different ways. Uh, corporations uh, have, um, have increased their role in the political system uh, in very, in my view, uh, you talked about lobbyists early on, uh, in, in my view, and I think this, this, this is a widely shared view, in very unhealthy ways. Uh, corporations are making enormous amount of contributions. They're essentially, there's no, I don't think there's a nicer way to put this, they're buying off, the bribing politicians uh, to get their dirty work done uh, in, in um, centers of power, the city council, uh, state legislatures, and, uh, and in Washington. And so if you're getting corporate money, uh, you, uh, notwithstanding the disclaimers by politicians, oh, I'm independent, I'm getting all this money, even though I'm getting all this money from Walmart and all these companies, when they go to Washington, it's, it's, uh, it's either explicit or it's implied that what they are doing by taking that money is essentially promising to go to Washington uh, to undermine, A, uh, labor laws. Uh, there, there's, there's no question that labor laws have been weakened in the United States. You can, right now, a corporation can fire workers. One out of four, one out of five American, uh, one out of five workers in the United States who tries to organize a union is fired. Uh, in one out of four cases, corporations threaten to shut down a plant uh, and move overseas uh, uh, you know, as a way to avoid uh, unionization. And a, a lot of the stuff that they're doing is, is actually illegal, but what has happened is that um, in Washington, Congress has weakened uh, enforcement uh, mechanisms so that uh, the penalty for doing so has become so negligible that for most companies it's simply another cost of, uh, uh, of doing business. There is no deterrence anymore. And uh, they've gotten to Washington and forced Congress back in 1994, as you know, to pass the... Uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, and more recently, uh, two, in, in 2005, the uh, Central American uh, Free Trade Agreement. And uh, some of you might remember the debate around these trade deals. Uh, the reason NAFTA passed with almost no 
um, um, conditionalities around workers' rights and uh, environmental standards and human rights standards is that corporations uh, prevailed. They not only were present in terms of uh, their lobbying power, but uh, corporation, I mean, uh, politicians who had, been, uh, who had received funding, there was a direct correlation between how much money uh, politicians received from companies and how they voted on the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, now, what NAFTA does quite simply is, you know, it lowers, it removes the, the, the tariffs between Mexico and the United States and Canada. Uh, that's a tax that, uh, you know, historically for um, especially developing countries that want to protect their economies, they've used that to, uh, to sort of um, manage their uh, and nurture the local, uh, local industries. And, and so when you remove that, you make it easy for companies to, uh, for goods and services to move uh, between borders. What has happened in Mexico as a result of NAFTA is that um, um, we, we have seen an, an, an increase in, in um, uh, migration from Mexico. That's one of, the, uh, one of the consequences of that trade agreement. I'm going to come back to that uh, later on, but I'm simply trying to demonstrate that uh, corporate power has uh, uh, produced for corporations uh, some real bonanzas out there so that labor unions are in a position now, a very weak position, because uh, uh, the, the laws have simply, um, um, uh, the, the laws have been, have, have been weakened and uh, uh, on the enforcement side, uh, they've gone ahead and defunded a lot of the uh, uh, agencies that enforce laws, and, and so you really don't even have uh, inspectors to come around anymore. If you look at the uh, Occupation of Safety, Administra Safety and Health Administration, Mine Safety and Health Administration, uh, those agencies that enforce uh, workplace safety standards, uh, I mean, there's an atmosphere of, uh, of impunity. Uh, a lot of corporations are operating right now in a cycle of impunity, uh, that is so at odds with how things should be in a democracy like this, in part because I, I was actually I was talking to um, uh, one of the, a union organizer from the South who was at that, uh, I don't know if you heard back in the, I forgot what year that was, it was in, in late 80s, a chicken plant in South Carolina caught fire and um, about 25 workers were, were killed. And uh, as it turned out, the owner of the, of the plant had, sh had, had padlocked the back against, against, uh, 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 against the law. You, you simply have to have, the, you have, to have uh, easy exits uh, in those plants. But uh, a chicken caught fire, and you know, the whole thing kind of escalated, and the place burned down, uh, and workers couldn't get out because the employer uh, said that people were stealing chickens, and he needed to, to padlock the, um, uh, to padlock the, the, the factory. But the... The, the, the upshot of the story is that um, you could, in, 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 since, since 1985, you could count on only one inspector uh, coming to inspect a plant once every 50 years for safety violations. So, so the word is out to corporations that, look, you, know, you can operate with almost total... Uh, impunity, you cannot expect inspectors to come in and expect, uh, inspect and, uh, uh, and, and enforce the law. So that, that is the, uh, kind of the general atmosphere. And so we, we, um, we think that this has really contributed to uh, undermining uh, labor and, um, uh, and, and sort of uh, allowing a, a, there's a sort of this heavy bias that we're seeing in our economy in favor of maximum, uh, maximum profits that are being done oftentimes at the expense of workers uh, and at the, expen at the expense of uh, our communities. Here in Chicago, we've really become a microcosm of some of these struggles. Some of you remember the Walmart, um, the Walmart um, uh, debate uh, back in 2006 uh, when Walmart wanted to come to Chicago, and uh, we, Jobs with Justice and several organizations said, uh, you can come to Chicago, but we want you to pay a living wage uh, to the workers. Walmart, as some of you know, is the... Um, um, it's the world's largest corporation. Uh, here in the United States, they have 1.3 million workers. <clears throat> it is also perhaps the most aggressively anti-union corporation. Uh, none, of the none of the workers in the United States who work for Walmart are allowed to join a union. The company has uh, a network of uh, consultants and uh, <clears throat> lawyers who come into town and pr pressure workers uh, and put all kinds of use all kinds of intimidations and, uh, to prevent workers from organizing. So none of the 1.3 million workers who work for Walmart are unionized. And uh, that's you know, what, sort of going back to, to the, uh, the, the political uh, uh, 
uh, the, the political issue was raised in that uh, Walmart is also one of the most active companies in terms of how they fund elected officials and uh, participate in um, um, and, um, members of business associations such as the Chamber of Commerce that make it possible in Washington for labor law to be, uh, to be um, weakened and, and to create the kind of uh, impunity that I just talked about. But um, so what we said in Chicago was that as a condition of coming into town, uh, you need to pay workers a living wage of $10 uh, an hour and an additional three dollars per hour that would cover health insurance. The reason for that is quite simple. Uh, it's, a, it's a wealthy corporation. Walmart makes about uh, 350 billion dollars in sales uh, per year and uh, makes about 11.5 uh, billion dollars in profits. Uh, it pays H. Lee Scott, the CEO, uh, 35 million dollars uh, per year uh, before uh, stocks. And uh, Mr. H. Lee Scott makes about uh, 16,000 dollars uh, per hour. Um, and his workers, uh, if you get your calculator out, at $7.30 is making almost exactly $16,000 uh, per year. Uh, and yet, um, uh, H. Liscott was in town with his, uh, with his army of lobbyists and lawyers in 2006 to convince the city council to oppose uh, the uh, living wage uh, ordinance. Well, we went ahead and uh, really did a lot of public education and explained to people that uh, the right to organize is fundamental. It's a, it's a key tenet of democracy. Uh, a corporation like Walmart that is, by the way, receiving $1.5 billion in tax subsidies from the public in the United States uh, should be expected to pay a, uh, uh, a living wage. The, um, the company can't simply have it both ways. You cannot, on the one hand, say to workers, you, we can't let you join a union, but um, you, know, you can't go to the legislature either uh, to ask the legislature to pass a law uh, to, to force us to pay a living wage. They argued in the city council that uh, uh, getting a, a living wage passed was essentially interfering with the marketplace. This would have a, a distorting effect on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on free enterprise. We just don't do that in America. We don't, uh, we don't regulate. We don't, we don't uh, um, artificially uh, raise wages, notwithstanding, of course, that we have a minimum wage nationally. Um, <clears throat> So the question for us was, you know, how do we get people, how do we convince people that this was the right thing to do? Uh, remember that a lot of these neighborhoods in Chicago are so vulnerable. Uh, you know, on the west side, you know, I mean, Walmart announced that they were coming into Chicago in 2003. Uh, that's the same year that Brock's Candy closed on the west side. And so it really, they, th their arrival into Chicago coincided with a lot of factory sh cl closures. Uh, Ryerson Steel Mill on uh, 83rd and Stewart. I had just closed down on the south side also. And, and so you have a vulnerability. On the political side, politicians are in a hurry to replace those jobs that, that, that they just lost. And they're vulnerable to, hey, listen, we're coming here. We want to give you jobs. We don't have the luxury to debate a living wage. The living wage uh, gets in the way. And, and so they really managed to portray any effort to force a living wage uh, on Walmart as, uh, ob as obstructionist, that this, this was not really about the living wages, the unions who just want to organize workers and, and collect um, collect uh, union dues. This, and so they really argued, uh, presented a false choice to Chicagoans, that the choice was really about uh, a low-wage warmer job uh, or no job uh, at all. And, um, you know, of course, a lot of the workers who are losing their jobs, 1,500 workers had just been laid off, had lost their jobs at, uh, at Brox. So, and you, you are vulnerable in that moment. But we, we decided to really um, um, set an example here in Chicago that corporations cannot be allowed uh, to come into these neighborhoods and exploit workers, um, the, the, it, it, you know, uh, and make billions of dollars without being, ac without being accountable. Um, and and one, of the, one of the things that was also important for us to mention was that Walmart has um, itself set a, um, uh, its, its business model is implicated in many of the problems that we're seeing right now. Walmart's business model, uh, predicated on low prices, um, has contributed to the decision of many companies, many manufacturers, in fact, uh, to shut down and move overseas. Because what happens is that um, Walmart now is so huge that they, they have a, a disproportionate share of the marketplace. For many manufacturers uh, who make products for Walmart, uh, you know, you'll find they've got one-third, sometimes a, you know, 50 percent of their contracts with, with, this, with this one company. You know, they're supplying a lot of stuff to Walmart. And so the bargaining table in terms of negotiating a contract disproportionately uh, favors uh, Walmart's representatives. They sit at the table and say, you know, that bicycle, last year we paid $20 wholesale for that. This year we want you to, uh, to reduce that to $15. Otherwise we'll go to that supplier over there. Uh, and so the, 
the, the factory owner is under pressure to figure out a way to continue to be profitable and reduce the price of that bicycle uh, to $15. So what do they do? They go back to the workers and say, you know, that pay hike you negotiated last year, not so fast. We have to renegotiate that because now we've, we've, got, we've got to reduce the price of the bicycle. Failing that, they have to oftentimes shut down and, and move overseas. Brax Candy closed on the west side and moved to Mexico. Uh, and Argentina, they, sp they split into two. So, in fact, the decision of many, uh, many uh, um, uh, suppliers to shut down and move is actually connected to the pressure that is, that, that, that is being exerted by uh, uh, huge retailers like, uh, like Walmart. So it's a, it's a business model that is really at the center. Uh, it's at the center of the decision of so many uh, companies to actually shut down and move. So for us, it was really a question of accountability. Is, should a company that is implicated in job flight in the first place be allowed to come back into Chicago and say they are now the solution to joblessness in Chicago and that they want to get away with paying a low wage to workers uh, in a sort of business as, as usual? And what happened to the right of workers to organize a fundamental right, uh, you could argue constitutionally, the right to associate, the right of free speech, right to assemble? Uh, but also, you know, looking at, uh, at, at the fact that this traditionally has been a, a very reliable way for workers uh, to earn a, uh, uh, a good wage. Another thing that people really understood was that um, um, the reason we wanted to force this corporation to pay a living wage and, and to pay health care benefits is that across the country, the reason Walmart are, is, is able to sell these products at such a, at such a cheap price is that um, they, they skimp on health care. Uh, this, uh, it's, a, it's a revolving door at Walmart. Walmart workers don't stay very long because if you stay too long, you start qualifying for health insurance. So they, they, they keep them just barely, you know, you, you get close enough to being full-time, 25 hours, 30 hours. You don't really get to be a full-time worker and so on, uh, therefore not qualify for health insurance. But what we found was that in, 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 in places like Georgia, for example, 10,000 kids in Georgia were found to be on the SGIP program, the state children's health insurance program, 10,000 kids whose parents worked for Walmart. Um, we, we found in Chicago Walmart workers on Section 8 housing. We found, we found Walmart workers uh, receiving LAHIP uh, support, uh, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Your tax money is subsidizing workers who work for the wealthiest corporation uh, on earth. And so, and so we really created a broad rationale why this company needed to be held accountable uh, to a living wage. Um, so, uh, to make a long story short, uh, we convinced the city council to pass this ordinance. It passed in, uh, in uh, July of 2006 by a whopping 35 votes uh, to 14 votes. Unfortunately, your mayor, Mayor Daly, uh, stepped in and uh, defended his, uh, his corporate uh, uh, friends and uh, vetoed th that ordinance. The living wage would have uh, uh, put $10 uh, per hour in the hands of 10,000 workers in Chicago. I would like for you to think for a moment what we are talking about right now in Chicago. Uh, we're talking about deficits, right? We're talking about budget deficits. We are selling parking meters. Uh, we're selling Midway Airport. We're selling public assets because the mayor said we have no money. And yet when the opportunity was available to him in 2006 to allow 10,000 workers uh, to be active economically, when, you know, when, if, if we had increased the pay, the workers who work for Walmart and Target and Home Depot and Menards, making a good $10 per hour would go back into those neighborhoods, contribute to, their, uh, to local institutions, buy stuff at the hardware store, at the barber shop, uh, the city collects a tax and actually helps its, uh, its, its revenue. So this is uh, the, 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 the neoliberal policies that Mayor Daly uh, has pursued are clearly implicated in the financial troubles that we're seeing today. This bias in, term, in, in favor of maximum, profit, pro, ma maximum uh, uh, profits for, for large corporations at the expense of workers, at the expense of neighborhoods. Development patterns in Chicago, that's a different story, uh, cer certainly have been favoring downtown uh, at the expense of, uh, uh, of neighborhoods. And so um, uh, the struggles that we've waged in Chicago are not unlike what's going on across the world, uh, that in fact what, what we're seeing here today, the pressures on workers to accept less pay, uh, the withdrawal of government. Have you noticed you know, government services being cut back? Uh, this has been the model, uh, the economic model of the past uh, 30 years. Um, 
you know, public spending being, uh, being cut back, being cut back uh, privatization of uh, uh, public assets. Uh, this is this is being played out. Play, it's, 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 it's being played out across uh, across the world, uh, and the connection is very real because uh, what we find is that a lot of the a lot of the companies, as I as, as I talked about, um, if, if you want to really understand the real connection between what we're seeing here in Chicago and what we're seeing across the world, is that when when corporations make the decision to leave the United States under pressure, obviously to come up with cheap products by the likes of Walmart, they are moving to another country. Uh, let's pick a place. Let's pick Dhaka, Bangladesh. A factory owner from the United States arrives in Bangladesh and says to the local elites, who, mind you, just like the Chicago politicians were under pressure to bring jobs because they just lost a factory on the south side and a factory on the west side and were vulnerable to, you know, kind of a, the sweet talk from Walmart about, you know, take this, you know, low-wage job. The, the political elites in Bangladesh are under, you know, a, 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 just as much, if not more, pressure to accept any deal to get that factory uh, to, to relocate uh, in, in, in Dhaka. So the conversation goes something like this. The factory owner says, uh, well, here we want to build this blue jeans factory uh, in your town. Uh, but you got to help us. You have to uh, sort of help us, uh, but, you know, sort of create a business-friendly uh, climate. Uh, in, in, in our world, that's, that's, uh, that's code for. Uh, you need to think about uh, preventing those union organizers uh, from coming to this plant and trying to organize uh, the workers. You need to do something about uh, those child welfare advocates who are going to be poking around this factory uh, to see if uh, children uh, or underage kids are being used uh, in this factory. You've got to do something about the environmentalists who are going to come around uh, to see what's being discharged into the local air, into the lo local water. Uh, and, of course, there's human rights activists who are always fussing about human rights and so forth. You've got you to keep them at, uh, at bay. Uh, the women's, women's rights advocates are going to be concerned about how women are being treated. Uh, but you know, So you get the drift. Um, and so what you're seeing there is the steady erosion of the, the, the building blocks for democracy uh, itself. Right? You can't have democracy without... Um, labor unions. You can't have democracy without women's rights advocates. You can't have democracy without environmental advocates. You can't have democracy without child welfare advocates. You can't have democracy without, uh, without civil society. That's what that is. And so the terms of entry into this country, the terms of entry for these corporations, the terms of entry for these factories into these countries is now implicated in the dismantling of the democracy project itself uh, in these countries with very dangerous uh, implications. But it also has enormous implications for, let's say, uh, immigration. Uh, when we talk about immigration in the United States, something that I, I, uh, I told Jamie I was going to uh, spend just a little bit of time talking about because it's important, it's important for me as, a, uh, as an immigrant personally, but also for, to have a kind of healthy, uh, robust, uh, fair, uh, and, and complicated de debate that, that it is. Immigration is not, a, uh, is not the easy debate because what has happened in the United States right now is that uh, that debate has, uh, in our view, illegitimately and single-handedly focused on uh, the people who cross the borders as if there's nothing else that happens out there. Uh, it has not focused on the, uh, on the forces and structures that are creating these dislocations uh, in other countries, and they need to be interrogated. Uh, people behind those decisions, policymakers who are making these decisions, uh, need to be held to account and be interrogated. So, so, so what happens in, in, in when, this, when these factories relocate to those countries uh, is that uh, you know the, the workers start feeling, uh, you know, they start getting marginalized. Right? They've entered that factory. They can't join a union. Right? You would think that uh, you would think that someone who is opposed to immigration in the United States would actually be supporting trade legislation that says that as a condition of signing on to a trade deal with the United States, you need to allow your workers to join a union. Because if workers in Mexico and you know, workers in, in, in Bangladesh at, at, at that blue jeans factory could join a union uh, and actually increase their wages and benefits and improve their lives, uh, it, it actually creates a disincentive uh, to, to, to migrate. Why would you want to move? Uh, migrations, migration is, 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 is quite simply a, a, an economic decision. Uh, workers, not unlike corporations, uh, they, they get up in the morning and they decide, um, I need to go someplace else to, someplace else to, uh, uh, to increase my earnings. What's interesting is that we've accepted the premise that corporations can, can traverse the globe in search of profits, uh, in search of profit maximization, and that's a perfectly rational decision. But there's some, somehow something subversive and unseemly and, 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 and offensive about a worker who decides to leave Mexico and come to the United States to do the same thing to find a way to increase his or her 
uh, earning potential. And so, and so um, this particular brand of globalization, this business model that is devoid of standards, because what really at the end of the day this is about is, is that companies are taking advantage of trade agreements that uh, do not explicitly protect the right of workers to organize, trade deals that do not explicitly protect basic environmental standards, trade agreements that do not protect human rights standards. That's what the debate about NAFTA was about. Labor unions and their allies in the environmental community and the human rights community were saying, let's not pass NAFTA without those key protections so that we don't create a race to the bottom in which the countries that are compromising their standards, compromising human rights standards, compromising labor standards, compromising environmental standards become the destination for corporations who want to uh, exploit um, um, you know, the, the vulnerability of these countries. And so, um, and so, and so that's, that's really part of what we need to engage in, but what we're engaging in, in a lot of organizations, social, social organizations here in the United States and, uh, and across the world are now zeroing in on this question of how do we uh, fashion uh, trade? How do we create? <clears throat> and and we're, not, we're, not, we're not anti-trade. I think the other side has been very shrewd in framing this debate as uh, those who are for trade and those who are against trade. And so when you question NAFTA, when you question CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, you are caricatured as, as, a, as protectionist and, and anti-trade, when in fact what we're arguing is that it is possible to have trade. We've always, for hundreds of years, had international trade. It's possible to have it, but it needs to be humanized. It needs to cater to the interests of workers. It needs to cater to the interests of communities. It needs to respect uh, human values. It needs to respect, uh, uphold basic environmental standards. And so, uh, uh, and, and so that's, that's what we need to do. And so just sort of proceeding on this question of immigration, um, so as, as globalization itself is implicated in, in, in mass migration, it's also important to look at how the, the role that corporations are playing in other things that are affecting uh, migration, right? I just talked about how trade, trade agreements are doing that. But there's another thing that, that, that we often don't think about. I was talking to my friends at the table here uh, before I got up here that... Um, we always talk about, about, about uh, sort of the, the environment as a, a kind of separate entity and, and uh, you know, environment, environmentalists as a kind of you know, public interest group. Um, uh, the whole discourse around global warming um, needs to shift away from just being an environmental issue as being a kind of social justice, you know, to put it in a social justice uh, economic frame because that's what it is, so that it includes uh, everyone. It, it, impacts, uh, it, impact, it impacts all of us. But... Um, um, just as a point of fact, in 2005, uh, 20 million people across the world were uh, classified as uh, climate refugees. These are people who are now leaving their uh, countries, and their uh, homes, uh, because of violent weather uh, patterns, radical shifts uh, in weather. Uh, in 2010, uh, 50 million, did I say 20,000 or 20 million? In 10, 20 million in, 20, in 2005. Uh, in, in, in 2010, 50 million people across the world would be classified as climate refugees. Um, by 2050, 150 million uh, people are going to be classified across the world as climate refugees. And so, um, the, so there's going to be migrations. I mean, the United Nations uh, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, back in 2006 uh, said that at any given time, 190 uh, seven million people across the world are in a state of uh, migration. So this is a global uh, phenomenon. Uh, but the debate cannot just focus on those individuals who are moving, which is what has been wrong with the debate in the United States. Uh, notice who is opposing climate change legislation in the United States. Notice the same people who are robustly and angrily anti-immigrant who find themselves denying that you know, human beings have anything to do with global warming. The global warming deniers are also at the forefront of the anti-immigration movement, oblivious to the fact that uh, U.S. policies, you know, the United States is 5% of the world's population, and yet it's producing 25% of the greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases uh, that are uh, uh, implicated in global warming. So the policymakers in Washington cannot wash their hands off and just say, so this is really about just people entering the United States, illegals. The illegals, uh, you, 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 they can't just say that. Their uh, inability to deal with global warming ought to be, imp ought to be interrogated, uh, ought to be 
uh, ought to be examined, and, and it's, it's, a, it's accountability. Um, the other factor is that, that, that you know, uh, maybe a little bit off topic, but I think it's, it's, it's connected, is that uh, the, the role corporations have played in, in um, some of the wars that the United States invo is involved in. I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, but I don't think you need to be a conspiracy theorist uh, to, 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 um, to understand that um, uh, business interests are very much um, a part of the, the, U the reason the United States is in Iraq. And so wars themselves, which, you know, if we solved our energy problems in the United States, uh, the energy crisis, if we start conserving energy and, and using alternative fuels, uh, I, I doubt very much that uh, there'll be uh, so much, too much eagerness to go to war in places like Iraq. But um, um, wars are, are implicated in mass migrations in ways that we, we very seldom talk about in this country, right? Uh, 2.5 million Iraqis are now di displaced internally uh, because of the Iraq war. Uh, 2.5 million are um, refugees outside of Iraq. And uh, they're going to end up some place, some country, the United States, the, the, United States, the U.S. is going to increase its intake of uh, Iraqi refugees. So what is the debate going to look like? Should it leave out uh, the person in 2003 who voted uh, to go to war in Iraq? When you find the Vietnamese people here, 900,000 Vietnamese were dislocated because of the Vietnam War. When you find them here, when you find people from Nicaragua, from El Salvador, from Guatemala, uh, from Chile, uh, chances are their presence here is connected to a decision somebody made to either go to war in those countries or sponsor one of the parties uh, to, to this dispute in those countries. There's no question that the United States, and I don't want to sit here and, and, and bash the U.S. necessarily because there's a lot of good that uh, this country does, but there's no question uh, that uh, the U.S. has been on the wrong side of the human rights debate uh, in, in these countries uh, for decades, and that uh, human rights abuses are, are one of the uh, key reasons people decide to leave their countries and go someplace else. There's a, there's a lot of flight that, take place, that takes place because uh, of, of human rights conditions in those countries. And so um, uh, I say this to say that the, 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 the discourse around immigration needs to be uh, a bit more sophisticated uh, than it has been. Uh, it needs to examine not just the people who cross the borders, but what it is that is causing them to make decisions, a decision so profound uh, to leave their homes and come to the United States. Let's look at the trade agreements that are creating problems in Mexico. Three million to six million Mexicans, according to the Economic Policy Institute and, uh, and the um, um, Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, both of those put the numbers between three, mil three million and six million Mexicans who have been displaced by, uh, because of NAFTA. Why? Because uh, grain that is produced in the United States, you know, corn belt and Iowa and Nebraska and Ohio and Indiana uh, is now sold in Mexico at much cheaper rates. You can uh, you buy corn in Mexico now at a cheaper rate than locally produced corn. And so the farmers in Mexico simply can't compete. They can't compete with Archer Daniels, Midland, and Monsanto and, and Dole. And, uh, it, so, so what are they doing? They're you know, essentially selling off their farms and uh, trekking to Mexico City and eventually ending up um, trek, trekking north to the United States to get, uh, to get work. And our, our politicians in Washington who voted for NAFTA show up at the border and say, let's build a wall and keep these people out and, and call them felons. Um, so there needs to be accountability. Uh, there needs to be accountability about, about wars, as I just said, uh, to people to think hard about what wars do, the sort of regional instability that are caused by wars, uh, and a whole host of factors. And so what, we, what, what um, Jobs with Justice, uh, with, with many other organizations, um, has attempted to do is to, is to sort of um, bring complexity to some, to some of these debates to say that it really, uh, A, it matters for citizens to get involved. It matters for unions uh, to grow and, 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 and uh, 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 for, for workers to join unions because they really become uh, uh, an important voice in, in, in nourishing this, this democracy. When workers um, are not doing well when workers have to work two, three jobs, which are some of the consequences of the low-wage economy, has been the kind of uh, um, the de facto disenfranchisement of people. The Chicago Tribune ran a series not too long ago of sort of the low-wage workers, women, single mothers who are working two, three jobs at minimum wage, who are traveling long distance. 60% of the new jobs being created, by the way, are being created in the suburbs. So there are a lot of people who spend a lot of time traveling to those jobs uh, at, uh, at very uh, uh, low wages. 
And um, it's very difficult to get poor people, get those folks to come to the city council uh, to rally and to lobby and to talk to their elected officials and to testify on their own behalf as to why a living wage is, uh, is important. It's very difficult to get them to show up in Washington, uh, the Congress or the state legislature, uh, to be active participants in sort of um, um, you know, creating uh, their own uh, uh, destiny. So the low wage um, business model has cost us quite a bit uh, in terms of the whole question of our civic participation, not just a, as, a, as, a, as a matter of uh, the economic, uh, sort of the social justice uh, question. It really is the case that uh, um, people right now are facing so much pressure that uh, political participation becomes uh, a luxury and sort of the exclusive province of middle class, uh, middle class uh, people. And so we need to be invested in, uh, in, in, in building this. Congress right now is considering passage of the Employee Free Choice Act, uh, which is a law that makes it easier. How am I doing on time, by the way? Um, the Employee Free Choice Act is a law that is going to start correcting some of these abuses of the past several decades. It's going to make it easier for workers to join unions. It says that with a simple card check, if 51% if of workers uh, at a workplace sign a card saying they want to join a union, that should automatically certify uh, the union. The way things work right now, when workers sign a card, the employer steps in and uh, there has the, 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 the National Labor Relations Board schedules an election, the so-called secret ballot. And there's a huge span of time between when workers make that declaration and when the first election takes place that it allows for an enormous amount of time for the employers to interfere uh, with, uh, with workers. The intimidations that I just talked to early on aren't just uh, the, the, the figment uh, of, of workers' imagination. Uh, every worker will tell you who's trying to join a union uh, the amount of pressure that they face, one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, uh, with, with employers, captive audience meetings, um, you know, 60% of, no, no, it's actually 80% of, uh, of employers hold uh, captive audience meetings when a, a, union, a, a union drive has begun at, at workplace. Uh, that means you get locked into a room and uh, you're shown these uh, vile videos of uh, labor unions and, and sort of videos that literally um, suggest that it's a, it's a subversive idea in the United States <laughs> to join a union. And, and so, and so uh, I've, uh, you know, I've seen it. I've seen some of those videos that are just, you know, outright uh, offensive. And um, the good news is that workers, uh, the b b vast majorities of workers have told pollsters that they will join a union tomorrow uh, if they were able to. They're not able to because the employers prevail. The employers put pressure on them. And, uh, so, uh, and so they don't. The second thing that the Employee Free Choice Act does is to triple the penalties. I talked early on about one of the things that has facilitated the decline in unionization is this uh, loosening of, in, of, of labor standards, labor law, um, and, and uh, the, 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 um, um, the very low penalties that the employers have to pay right now. The Employee Free Choice Act, EFCA, will fix that by tripling penalties for employers who violate the law. So we want to create a disincentive. We want to make sure that if you fire somebody who's trying to join a union, that the penalty will be high enough uh, to make you think twice about it. Uh, the third thing that EFCA does is to uh, impose arbitrary, uh, 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 mandatory arbitration. Because what happens typically that is that even if you, if you have a, a, an election um, and then you begin contract talks, employers can delay uh, those contract talks. They can just, you know, just... Uh, uh, and engage in all kinds of stays and, 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 uh, and, and delays that, um, you know, workers lose interest or they, they move on, they get fired or, the, you know, for whatever reason. And, you know, it's just, it's a process that allows employers to just, you know, play for time. And I've been to those schools and I, the difference is palpable between a school in the south side of Chicago and a school in, uh, in, in Schaumburg, the in levels of investment. I mean, Jonathan Kozol has a book out showing how in Highland Park, per capita spending, uh, for students is $14,000. In Chicago, it's $8,000. No one can argue that those things don't matter. And, and, and so, uh, uh, but, but, but since funding is a function of uh, uh, sort of this, this, this formula around, uh, 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 you know, mortgage, uh, it's, it's, it's based on, on, on tax, yeah, pro property taxes, excuse me. Yeah, I'm getting tired. Um, yeah, so, so, so if people are making, so, so the argument then has to be that we need to work, make sure that people are making additional, right? People are making decent incomes, right? Because that translates into, they buy you know, nice homes and uh, they pay into their 
uh, education and, and, and so forth. So we can't, we can't really, the question of income is clearly at the center of, of this debate and that what's happening in these neighborhoods uh, is directly related to, uh, uh, to what we're doing to the economy. And so we have to bring an end to the, to the era and I, I think some of that is coming to an end right now. I think with the election last year, uh, both in terms of the Congress and, and, and uh, the presidential election, I think that there's a mood in this country right now of citizens wanting to be engaged and wanting to hold public officials accountable and saying no, no and, and really sort of bring an end to the cycle of impunity within within which corporate America has uh, uh, has functioned. We can't have a system where, you know, bankers get sixteen billion dollars in, in in bonuses last year on Wall Street. Sixteen with a B billion dollars in, in bonuses while they're driving the system straight into the ground. Uh, citizens of a democracy cannot allow that level of impunity. So so uh, my hope is that uh, you know in your teachings and and um, uh, in your sort of uh, uh, personal life that. These are issues that you, you keep in mind and you continue to, to educate and, um, and get your students involved in a in uh, great uh, civic uh, project. Thank you very much.